can do give you now i can give you a quick update on uh, the uh, the next session because hydrogen session is over so we now still have one session uh, of the forum which is very interesting for myself because it is the near future so how can we realize uh, the near future of evitals of electric aviation because we heard about in the sessions today that there is the certification there there is test centers the end that there is the uh, traffic control we heard yesterday which has to be adapted to these new systems um so having this said uh we uh getting ready our next session where we will have speakers i think let me double check here who's to be the next speaker because uh one of the most impressive uh, 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 yes, we have Electra Solar, uh, Kalin, he's already up there. Uh, before this, we have another speaker um, who is uh, uh, unluckily not able to come, also from California, um, because they, uh, it's a company opener, which is ha having uh, eVTOL in the ultralight class, ultralight category, which basically means 115 kilograms empty weight uh, and then uh, you can fly it without any certification without any pilot permit they use the trick for the aircraft because it is said in the rules if you have a parachute on board and if you have um, uh, floats on board then you get additional weight so their aircraft comes up to an empty weight of about 180 kilograms and i would like to show a short video which because for me it was very impressive we had this uh this year at uh, oshkosh they've already been flying last year but only on the ultralight area but they progressed with the aircraft uh though so that they got the permission to fly in the main air, sh air show at the evening and um, i will just show and ken calkling uh the head of the company uh was not able uh to uh was not able to uh make it to the presentation here because they are right now have a convention of air shows in united states and at this air shows um they want to fly next year and they want to go into production and sell the aircraft next year they have produced more than 100 prototypes and um, I will just show the short video and it will come later in the That's discussion about ultralight being a solution for different kind of electric aircraft uh, later. So I'll try to share my screen but and start.
Okay, uh, this is something we will talk about later more. Now I give the stage to my uh, uh, longtime friend. I've flown one of his air first aircraft, I think more than nearly 20 years ago. Um, and he's uh, Kalin Gologan he, with his company Electra Solar together with his colleague, Konstantin uh, Kondak. And he will give us an update on the Electra trainer because the session we have now is how the electric aircraft can get into the air or are in the air as well and how we can get hands on and can get flying electric. So Kalin, if you can share your screen and then maybe we check the audio. I think yeah. the audio is fine because he was talking already before and then I will mute my mic. It's uh, yeah, not in presentation mode yet. You're still in the... Ah, now it is. Okay, then I'll leave you the stage and up to you. So, short presentation of our last product, Electra Trainer, which is a two seat electric aircraft designed for pilot training and flying schools. We present this together with Constant in Conduct. We are both CEO of this company, Electra Solar. So we have 10 years experience in manned and unmanned electric aircraft. You can see here our products starting with Electra 1, with Electra 2 Solar. There is some, some of what you know as Solar Stratos, one aircraft in, in, uh, in Switzerland. We built also a completely unmanned version. We flew with this 10 kilometer high. We certified Electra 1 last year in Germany. Uh, the first ultralight certification electric and now we started and in uh, about one and a half year we succeeded or will succeed to certify the aircraft the start of the project was middle of 2021 we are now in december when we helped to get the certification of electra trader december uh, electra solar is a spin-off of a german airspace center dlr the first uh, Flight was in March 2011, Electra One. In uh, the same year, we got the Lindbergh Prize in Oshkosh. And uh, 2015, we flew over the Alps, uh, Electra to Solar. Uh, the first uh, flight was 2017. And in 2019, we flew with the Unman version, 10 kilo solar version with 25 meter span. 10 kilometer high, completely autonomous, including start and landing. In October 21, we got the German ultralight certification of the one seat version Electra One. What is interesting for our company is that the whole intellectual property is belonging to our company, starting with the structure of the aircraft, uh, then electric power unit, power supply, and board electronics, solar power system, autopilot. Uh, and ground control station. So we don't. We are not dependent on uh, providers. Another interesting thing is our design philosophy. We design a family of aircraft which looks from outside, from design, uh, similar, have the same structure systems, the same uh, power unit systems, the same autopilot system. Advantage is that do, through this process, we reduce development and certification time, we reduce risk and cost, and also is a branding. The branding, this form is a branding also the color of the aircraft. Most of them are yellow. Now I show you a video to see, get an image. It's a, a simple grass, bad grass runway, starting be in the air in one 100 meter climbing here is one seat up to eight or ten meters per second uh, it's an incredible uh, climb rate uh, with a electric engine uh, hpd 50 getting in the first 60 60 seconds uh, more than 70 kilowatts electra trainer is a modified version of electra one and uh, has a longer fuselage a wider one and uh, flying time demonstrated uh, more than two hours, 2.5 hours, flying in horizontal flight with 12 uh, kilowatt. We have a portable charger, only 
12 kilograms, so we can uh, not depend on an uh, infrastructure. We can use the normal plugs with a normal four plugs. We get 12 kilowatt, and with this, in one hour, we can fly load one hour, fly one hour. Uh, glide ratio is very high, over 25. A cruise speed from the 120, and we have on board 35 kilowatt hour of battery. And the whole aircraft was designed for fly club, clubs and flying schools uh, for very low operation cost and low noise. So I think that the most important advantage of Electra Trainer is uh, low noise and low operation cost. The project status, the German ultralight certification is expected in this month. Tomorrow, the test pilot will come from Dulf to make the reception flight. And the highlights, uh, as I told, aerodynamic, wonderful aerodynamic, like a glider, robust, lightweight, carbon poly structure. The aircraft weights without battery only 240 kilogram. We have a double redundant propulsion unit. Operation costs are 65 euros per hour. We have a long range endurance, uh, range about 300 kilometers, emission free anyway, as electric. But the strong point is the noise level. We did our noise certification test, and we have 48 decibel, according to ICAO Annex 6, Chapter 10 standard. We have now a towing device installed and uh, demonstrated with single gliders. And in the next uh, weeks, we We'll try or we'll tow also a dual seat glider, which is very important. We have a large cabin, one to five meter wide, accommodating pilots up to two meter. We have simple logistic because we can transport in a normal glider trailer. And very in interesting and important is that the sample time uh, will be optimized to be 30 minutes by only one person. Because in that case, if you have a hang, uh, trailer, you don't need a hangar place, which costs also a lot. I show here a video with our towing. Unfortunately, the quality is not so good. In that day, we was not planned to do a towing, but the condition was good. And it works wonderful. We can uh, tow with 40 kilowatts, so not maximum power for a sing single glider. This was in Königsdorf, close to the place from Vilitake, <laughs> Murnau. We continue our towing program in Königsdorf and extend our basic certification with towing capability. But this low noise never level is very important for flying clocks and uh, and to 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 have no noise. And now I you see here an extraction from our noise test 48.38. And let's make a comparison. So this noise is like a light rain or quite office. And if we take Airbus A32 Neo with the most advanced airplane, it has 85 decibel. And this 85 is 50 percent less than the normal Airbus C20, and this modern aircraft is 13 times uh, has 30 times more noise than Electra train. It's the company who did our test uh, told us they never measured a uh, noise never level under 50. This diagram is also important. You can see you can fly in this case. Uh, in a flying school, seven flight hours per day, because you fly 50 minutes or one hour, charge 30 minutes again, 50. You start with 35 kilowatt, and at the end of the day, you still have 10 kilowatt. We will start next year, the beginning of next year, with the first Electra trainer, uh, normal operating as trainer. Our test pilot, Uwe Nordmann is also a very experienced uh, uh, flying teacher, and he will start to teach his uh, 
is people with Electra training. So this aircraft enter in operation practically next year. Data sheet is uh, simple 600 kilogram uh, total weight. We have payload 200 kilogram, a cruise about 120 kilometers per hour. So most of these uh, parameters I defined before. Uh, now, Konstantin will comment a little about our digital aircraft platform, which is something completely new and is uh, mostly the invention and from Konstantin. Yeah, this is a uh, new project uh, we launched uh, some time ago. Now, uh, digital aircraft platform uh, was taken in operation together with a trainer. Uh, the idea behind this digital platform is to provide uh, additional service for automated inspection and maintenance for our aircraft. It works uh, like this. Uh, aircraft has a special sensor sensoric system, uh, which provides uh, all the data from the propulsion system uh, together with uh, extended data for from the flight uh, uh, state of the aircraft. So this data are transferred automatically to the cloud infrastructure and then with special algorithms uh, using uh, artificial intelligence, we perform a deep analysis uh, considering also the history of this aircraft as well as also, this will be the future, the history of the complete fleet, yeah? And um, analyzing this huge amount of data, we uh, will be able to provide uh, also some uh, prediction of uh, um, uh, failures and also to simplify the maintenance of the aircraft. What the customer will see at the end is uh, even uh, less uh, costs uh, for, uh, for the um, inspection and maintenance. It means also less cost for the operation of this aircraft. Now, you know, for uh, operation cost is a very important thing. We calculate the operation cost for about 400 hours per year, uh, 65 euro. This cost includes depreciation costs, uh, cost we pay for the aircraft, electricity, battery, maintenance, and insurance. This way, uh, if we consider normal ultralight costs today for flying club, at least 100 euro, you save 35 euro per our in the life of the aircraft 10,000 hours, you save 350,000 euro, which is much more than the uh, cost of the aircraft. Here we see uh, during the uh, electric fly in uh, show and the competition in Bern in this year, we won the first place in the electric aircraft class. You see here our test pilot and uh, salesman Uwe Nordmann, with more than 9,000 hours of flight experience. Uh, the second place was uh, uh, Pipistrel. You see he Dominic Gizin, Olympia skiing champion. And we, <laughs> for the range, uh, the goal of the, this competition was maximum range. And we were about more than two times more range than Pipistrel. Here you see the placard which we won in Bern. Wonderful show and uh, competition. Here you see a play a dual uh, tandem flight together with Igenius from University Stuttgart. So here are some nice photos from us, and this is uh, during our official first flight on the airport in Memmingen between. Uh, airliners and business jets. Okay, this was shortly the presentation of our new product. If you have questions, we can answer all later after the session. Yeah, thank you very much, Tallinn. And um, I think this is really great um, to see that aircraft coming into production also maybe <laughs> Not everybody around the world is aware of that ultralight, especially in Germany, this ultralight aircraft are a class which over the last 15 years has taken a large part of the market where before we had general aviation aircraft. 
and now like a lot of training and so on is done by ultralight aircraft the maximum weight for ultralight aircraft in germany is 600 kilogram in some other european countries like france it is a little bit lower and um for explaining a little bit more on the ultralight category which i think is a very important category for electric aviation why because the certification standards are lower not lower in a case of safety but lower in the uh, in the case of what to do there and we couldn't have a better person explaining this especially concerning electric aviation than Günther Spitzer who is actually uh, used to be the technical referent of the DULF, which DULF is the German Ultralight Association. And this is a special situation which we have here on the um, case that the certification, that we do a kind of certification, it's not like the, in, uh, the ultralight category in the United States, where you don't have any certification, you can fly what you want unless it meets the basic limits, which is weight and power and uh, fuel capacity. But in Germany, we have a certification for ultralight, but this is much lighter than in other uh, than the general aviation and uh, category and much less cost intensive. So, Günther, uh, can you check your mic? Um, yes, I think. One, I two, or three. Well. Can you yeah, hear me? It's fine. Uh, it's all fine. I don't know because we thought we are going to discuss. I'm not sure if you have uh, any presentation uh, ready for explaining what uh, Dolph is doing on the ultralight field or not. Uh, yes, I have uh, something prepared yesterday. That, that's and, perfect. Uh, and then I would I, say you do the presentation, then we have the last speaker of our session, and then we start discussing. Okay, just give me one second. No problem. Because... So now I need to find out how to... You have, you have an option down there which says share screen. And when you have share, share screen, there is a second, uh, there is on the left, uh, and corner at the bottom uh, uh, where okay. you can click for share sound. Now, yeah, a screen is coming. Yes. We okay, see. can you see the, yes. um, the document? It's, okay. Yeah, but it's not in full screen mode. Uh, it's in a window mode. If you go to window, I think you can uh, um, uh, uh, at the upload corner and say uh, full screen. Um. Wo, wo Fenster steht. Bei Fenster, äh, wenn du da normal drauf gehst, kannst du sagen Full Screen. Ah, nee, bei Anzeige, Anzeige, sorry, Anzeige. Oben links, Datei bearbeiten, Anzeige. Moment, Moment. Oben links. Um, das sehe ich nicht. Ein Moment. Ich du, schaust, schaust, du hast doch Datei bearbeiten, Anzeige von. Ähm, no. Uh, Anzeige. Ach so here, nein, nein, this ja, is, da, genau. is eine, uh, this is, it's, it's not a presentation, it's, uh, it's yeah, just a anyway, document I created. Anzeige, you can make full screen mode. I think if you go Anzeige, okay. uh, uh, Zoom, uh, Seitenanzeige, blah, blah, blah. Here, here it is. Okay. Exactly, perfect. All right, thanks, thanks a lot for assisting me. Um, so uh, hello to everybody. Um, my name is uh, Günther Spitzer and uh, one month ago Willi Tucker asked me uh, to take part in this forum to answer questions about certification process uh, in Germany. Yesterday I found myself on the speaker list and that is the reason why I do not uh, have prepared a real presentation, but I hope that I can clarify a few misunderstandings about the certification of small sports aircraft uh, in this country. In Germany, we have two organizations which have the permission from the German government to do certifications for 
aircraft up to 600 kilograms max takeoff weight. Here we call these type of aircraft ultralight aircraft or uh, microlights. The two organizations are the DAEC and the DULV, the German Ultralight Aircraft Association. In the past, I have been the technical representative for the DUL for about eight years, but at this time, I'm only a consultant uh, for the DUL. I cannot talk about the DAEC, and I am not the official representative of the DULF, but I like to explain how the certification of sports aircraft works in Germany. <clears throat> oh, this is not the right screen. This is it. Um, the DULF is a membership organization which finances its work purely from membership fees. Members are ultralight pilots, not manufacturers or other organizations. This means that the DULF is running on a very low budget, no funding or support of the government or else. As mentioned before, the DULF has the permission of the German government to certify sports aircraft, whereas ultralight aircraft are limited to two persons, pilot and passenger, which means the DULF has no stakes in certifying autonomous flying airplanes or airplanes which are aiming for the commercial market, like flying taxis or equivalent. If the project is a one or two place airplane, which only represents a first step towards commercial airplanes, the DULF most likely will not accept the project from the beginning and will forward it, will forward the applicant to the European Aviation Safety Agency, the EASA. The idea behind the project must be the pure sportive usage of the finished product. The German ultralight certification should not be misunderstood as a cheap way to achieve a certification which will allow companies to test their prototypes in public air traffic. I might have to add that there are different classes of ultralight airplanes in Germany. Fixed wing airplanes, flexible wing called trikes, motorized hang gliders, powered parachutes, gyrocopters, and ultralight helicopters. In May 2020, after a long fight with the German LBA, the requirements for electric airplanes were published and released. These requirements enable the uh, DULF to certify electric, electric airplanes. <clears throat> the DULF put a lot of effort into the rulemaking process and into discussions with the LBA. And so far, one electric airplane has been certified according to these requirements. The one is uh, the one we, we have seen before, uh, the one from uh, Kalin Bologan. In the beginning, like uh, six to eight years ago, eVTOLs were thought to fit into the category of ultralight helicopters, which in the meantime has proven not to be right. As a membership organization, the DULF has neither the financial means to train available technical, technical personnel nor the budget to hire additional technicians, which would be necessary to, service, to satisfy the needs for certifying eVTOLs or even drones. Commercial eVTOLs and drones are covered from other certifying agencies.
Certification of electric powered airplanes is not much different to other airplanes. When it comes to structural or flight testing, the requirements are much the same. The only difference is the propulsion unit. For the integration of electric drives, there is a complete amendment in the LTF UL concerning the requirements for the installation and operation of these units. Electrical drives have been found or will find their way into most all of the different classes of ultralights. The drive units do not have to undergo a separate certification process since they can be certified together with the aircraft. The main drive unit may be a direct battery powered electric drive or any type of hybrid propulsion unit. If the drive unit is a hybrid drive, then the same requirements for the engine have to be met like in a non-electrical ultralight. The requirements for the electric drive units are pretty much based on the technologic standards which have been evolved in the field of high power electric drives and installations. I do not want to go too much into detail since the requirements concerning the drive unit and the, the battery are pretty much straightforward and do normally not create too big an obstacle for the certification. The maximum power of the electric system is limited to 900 volts DC. If the drive unit is designed to run on more than 60 volts, it has to be treated as a high power voltage system with its special requirements. Batteries must be placed in ventilated areas and a fire detection and warning system has to be installed. Batteries must have active protection circuits against over and under voltage and thermal runaways. Batteries have to undergo special tests which prove the applicability for the usage in ultralight airplanes. I am absolutely sure electrical propulsion units will enter the ultralight market more and more in the future. And as everybody else in the industry, the DULF will gather more and more experience and competence in this still new area of aviation. Thank you all very much for listening and I wish you all the best for the future. Blue skies. Thank you, Gunther, and uh, thanks very much. S sorry that I wasn't precise enough uh, inviting you because I think, yes, first we talked about having you in the discussion when we talk about the different subjects, uh, but I think this was very helpful to clarify a lot of these points. And I think to more of this, we will come later uh, in the discussion because I already now have several questions on this. Um, so uh, in about uh, 15, 20 minutes, we'll talk about the questions. And I'm sure we also have questions from the audience on this as several manufacturers approached me how to they can certify their electric aircraft in Germany. And there, I think you are the right person. And our next speaker now is uh, Eric, Eric Litum. He has been in the eFlight Forum, I think, already once. Um, with us, and I think he also was uh, traveling one time to the real forum, if I remember right, Eric. Yes, you correct, uh, you correct. The last one in 2019, uh, we were meeting, so those were nice times where we still could see peace people in person. Um, but hopefully, next year uh, will happen again. Uh, hopefully, at the e flight forum China, maybe at Aero. Um, Eric is working in the electric field for a long time. He is, and this is an interesting point for us, from Norway. And Norway, we heard this in several presentations over today and yesterday, will be most likely one of the countries which will have the first uh, electric aviation system running because also the government there is 100% behind it and they made decision already that they want to have electric commuter aircraft replacing the existing fleet. 
And as Norway has uh, more than 90% uh, renewable energy, uh, they are the ideal place also to do have electric aviation, which has a climate impact because the ele energy, the electric energy is not produced by coal mines, uh, coal um, uh, power plants or other power plants. It is produced by renewable energy. So I let's see if you can share your screen and then uh, and your, we check your mic and then the stage is yours. Ni hao, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you and we see your presentation. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Willie. Uh, it's an honor to be here again. It was a joy to travel to China the last time, and I'm glad I was invited to attend online this time. And I hope I will be able to come to China again in the future. It, uh, it is a lot of interesting technologies we can work on together. And today I will talk about the projects that we are working on in Norway, in my company, Alfly Group, and also a bit about the market possibilities to enter electric aviation as a commercial possibility in the Nordic market. So uh, my team is, um, is um, a team that has experience. The team has built two electric airplanes earlier and I will show a picture of these, these airplanes. My name is Eric Lietum. I work with electric aviation since 2018. I have a private license and I started to look into the fuel situation and uh, I was thinking that electric engines are far better than combustion engines. So that's why I was interested in the new technology of electric planes. I've been driving an electric car for 10 years. And in Norway, the sale of electric car is about um, 90 something percent. Nobody is buying combustion cars anymore. And the ferries in Norway uh, of um, ferries transporting cars along the coast is also almost everyone now uh, being electrified. And why are the ferries being electrified? There are two reasons. The government want to cut emission, and that's good for the planet we live on. And also the business case improves for the owners of the ferries. And my assumption is that with electric aviation, it is possible to make money in the uh, aviation industry, which is super hard, but it's possible. And I think it will be interesting to see how the government treat electric aviation with uh, tax exceptions, no VIT, and things like that. In my team, I have Thomas Brödreschiff, who has produced an electric seaplane already, and Eric Sandal, which I work together with in my computer company for many years. The first uh, plane that the team has built is an electric seaplane, two-seater, was starting out as a hybrid, but went pure electric. And this is uh, built from bottom up a new construction. This project is um, an interesting project that the team learned a lot from. And this is the background for the reasons why we are looking into seaplanes for commercial size, which I will show you a picture. This uh, has had first flight uh, in 2019, I think. And it was a huge success in the way of trying to do something brand new in a different way. The water um, elements of the plane were not uh, the way uh, performed, not in the way we wanted. So the program, project is put on hold at the moment. This is an interesting project we did afterwards, which is something that we've looked into for the Airways E. It's a conversion of something called a Kasut. Here is a picture of the old plane. What we did is to install 250 kilos of battery and electric engine. And uh, this is a race plane. So the race pilot, Reininga, 
is uh, flying it and it's a very difficult plane to fly as you see the steering surface here for the tail it's extremely small and this is built for very high speed so this can be considered a formula one car of the sky and this has one seat and there is no commercial uh, possibilities except that we want to have sponsors for the plane uh, but uh, the way we use it as a technology driver and test bed like Mercedes and the other companies in the Formula race cars. We had a first flight and we have learned a lot. We have different sensors in the plane and we hope to do a world record of speed and some other records next year when we have upgraded some of the systems of the plane. And um, this is in a very light class. The plane is like 450 kilos. So it's a very light plane. So it can go really fast. It is also, we learn a lot. And uh, for example, heat management. Heat management is something you really have to master if you're gonna do electric aviation and cooling systems. Actually, one of the things we learned from this project was that we have underestimated the need for cooling. So that's one of the things we need to upgrade to fly faster with the plane is to upgrade uh, cooling on inverters and some of the electric systems. The main project we are working on now is an electric seaplane. I've uh, shown some pictures before of this and we are trying to do something that is really hard. I mean, electric aviation is hard and an electric seaplane is harder. So if somebody think we are mad, I can't disagree because this is a really challenging project, but we think it can open a lot of possibilities. This is an amphibious plane, which means that we can utilize existing airfields but also use water as the landing and takeoff area. It's a fixed wing, nine seater, nine passengers with luggage. That's what we aim for, to transport people on short hops in high speeds. And now we come to the, the subject of today is why Norway is a market possibility. As Willy stated out in my introduction is that green power, the Norway has hydropower and we have approximately 98% renewable energy. Norway has a huge coastline that makes us use aviation to get around today. We use normal aviation and Norway has 5 million inhabitants. But we use aviation as we were 10 times more people. Avinur, who is running 43 of the airports in Norway, have a passenger count of approximately 50 million packs per year. So in Norway, in the north of Norway, the roads are bad and we use small planes for all the hops. A lot of the plane trips is less than one hour. And I mean, some of them are really short and this is doable by electric aviation. And since Avinur, which is owned by the Norwegian government owns half of the big airports or all of the big ones down to some very small, it is possible to negotiate deal and talk to the government in a very one-to-one -one way. And the politicians of Norway really wants Norway to be the test bed and start place of electric aviation. So there is huge possibilities here. And if you look at the Nordic market, we have also the neighboring countries of Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. I will come back to that. So <clears throat> the possibility in Norway is that traveling with a car takes a lot of time. And that is a problem, right? because it gives you um, a, a lot of time to do traveling. But then again, if you look at the um, distance in air, it's very short. I have an example here 
it's very local. It's Bergen, which is Norway's second largest city where I'm sitting, to Stavanger, which is the fourth biggest city in Norway. Along the west coast of Norway, all the oil, gas, shipping, fishery, and salmon farming is doing. So there is a lot of revenues created for big businesses here. And as for example, to travel from the Bergen to Stavanger, you have to go to the airport, the black marker, and then fly to Stavanger. And the flight is approximately only 30 minutes. And then you need to take a bus or a taxi down to Stavanger again. And you can forget about the train because then you go completely around the country. And uh, a lot of people are traveling by flights each year. It's approximately half, over half a million people traveling this route by plane today. And it's completely doable by electric aviation. It is approximately 160 kilometer distance in the air. And you actually pass two different airports that you can use at, as alternates if you're going to use the airports. Our mission and project is the exciting one of traveling city center to city center. And city to center to city center, we want to try to do what the EV tolls are doing to get the customer into where the people are. And we think to utilize the, la the sea as a landing and takeoff area with a fixed wing, it's a much better physical proposal than trying to land and do EV toll. Because I usually say that gravity really sucks and it's hard to make a battery electric plane or a hydrogen electric plane to do flights with rotors like the EV tolls. But we think that the fixed wing seaplane can be a solution. And the thing is to go into the city center where people are exactly the same as the EV toll, but we will taxi out as a, bo as a boat and do electric flight from the harbor. So one of the reasons also you should look into the market in the Nordic is that the Nordic countries is approximately almost 30 million people in five countries. We are very innovative and Elflu group is a part of something called NEA, Nordic Network for Electric Aviation. And if you want to do projects and approach us, please send me a mail and contact us and we can help you because all of these co companies here are working together trying to make the Nordic countries the best place to launch it. Because we have clean energy, we have innovative um, people that really want to do new ways of traveling. And as long as we can do it safe, people really say that they want to do it. And also the politicians say that they will give grants and possibilities for companies to use the Nordic countries for doing electric aviation. Yeah, and why are we doing this? It's because of the climate. And the, the globe is in a dire strait uh, at the moment. And um, the UN published some reports about that it's actually going worse than they were thinking, faster to uh, high temperatures. So we try to do this to be able to travel because we need to travel, we love to travel, but we also need to take care of the globe that we live on. Um, that was what I planned to say. Um, Willie, do you have any more things to, to say or? No, yes, uh, the, the, I think, thank you very much. And I think this was one other aspect. So I think in the two days now, we had a really good rush through all the aspect of electric aviation. And I would like to ask the uh, um, other speakers of this session back onto the screen again. We still have some time for Q&A, not too much. Um, background is, as we're working around the globe and in China, they are already getting to dinner time. And they, as it's the last day of the forum, they several people are leaving. So I would say we do some quick Q&A session. Then 
we do the opening official opening ceremony and i ask uh, and i offer everybody who wants to stay from around the globe inside the call that we can continue q a and discussion later in this call but um now i would say we have five minutes q a and we already have the first question i think from the audience uh from where where is it? from in the zoom in Zoom, ah, in the Zoom chat, yeah, I have to find the Zoom chat. Um, wait, where we have the Zoom chat? Uh, I have to find my. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question from the audience to uh, Günther. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that there will be some special require a special test for battery, of uh, uh, for dude to test the electric ultralight. So, are there any like a uh, compliance in the a compliance uh, um, standard. standard or something that um, Doof uses or borrows, like a, perhaps like ASTM standard or something. Could you uh, specify such a means of compliance for this special test? Thank you. Um, okay. Um, yes, there are. There is a um, a list of requirements. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's a German law, and it contains all. Um, the requirements for the installation and the testing of the, the battery units. I, I, cannot, uh, uh, I cannot tell you every single point of it, um, but I'm, I'm happy to, to forward the, the requirement list if you um, send me an email or uh, to Billy. Okay, thank you. Um... My question would be to um, to Eric uh, on the uh, electric aviation on the seaplane. In your when do you think your nine-seater aircraft can be ready? Just a rough time strain. I know it's very difficult, depending on money, depending on a lot of other details. But I, I think that's always the point, which uh, which is interesting. In our business plan, we are planning to build three vehicles as an experimental test one first that will have first flight within 2025. And commercial operation, we plan to have at full scale in 2030. So there is a seven to eight year time frame. But first flight, I will hope that I could invite you, Willy, to a first flight in 2025, 24, something like that. And we're looking down on some critical design reviews and uh, we have a lot of new updated um, drawings and we will probably have um, unveiling of this in the beginning of 2023. So I hope that I can see you uh, this point at Arrow and maybe we you even can bring some uh, model of the aircraft to Arrow so that the people can really see this in great because although we have quite a good reach uh, around the globe under specialists, I think as we also have to promote electric aviation to the general public, uh, we have to show as much as possible uh, high profile for the people to see that something is going on. I have uh, the next question to Günther again, it is uh, you mentioned that uh, you do not want to do any more eVTOL uh, as you don't see um, eVTOL as an object for flying for the members of the association. But uh, this is for the existing eVTOL. But what about if there are eVTOLs which are aiming to be uh, like this opener I showed at the beginning, um, would this still then be that Dul says, no, we're not interested to do anything with them? Or would this then be, okay, if it's for the pilot and if they are offering a product, probably have already started offering this product in the United States, would then Dul be interested to look in it again? Or is the decision, no, we, we don't look at eVTOL anymore, like you've done with a volocopter? Um. Okay, let me try to, to answer this. Um, when I was talking about EV tolls, uh, in the back of my mind, I had the, the um, commercial EV tolls. Okay. Um, I, I think there are always um, exceptions possible, like uh, the opener, 
because uh, the opener is obviously uh, impossible to use as it is oh, as a, a commercial uh, transportation airplane. Um, and so I think this is where the, the uh, Dulf distinguishes between uh, sportive use and uh, commercial use. So would be the same. I think we have the eMagic which is also flying under uh, Dulf uh, regulations as a sport aircraft. Yes. So I just wanted to clarify this because in your, uh, on your sheet it was written, no eVTOL. I just wanted to encourage the people, if you build an eVTOL for the people, which is safe and can be flown by a pilot himself, uh, then uh, it could be integrated in the Dulf, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Willie, I have a question for yeah. Callan. Yes. So my, my question for Callan is, uh, with your very nice new two-seat aircraft, have you considered a version with a conventional landing gear? I know the, uh, the single wheel configuration can have some real operations when you're, uh, have some real limitations when you're operating from a narrow runway or a runway that has uh, runway lights. So the answer is very simple. The next three aircraft will be built with fixed landing gear. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> this okay. is an option for test. It's good for aerodynamic, but in reality, flying clubs and, uh, and uh, flying schools will, will need fixed landing gear. So we are free to build both of them, but I suppose that most of them will be with fixed landing gear. Mm -hmm. um, I see I have to interrupt our question session. So like I said, you're happy. We, I'm happy to, if you stay because I still have some questions as well. But I see that our Chinese partners are getting ready. And due to the time differences, uh, we would do the opening, uh, the official closing uh, ceremony very quick. And then we uh, can continue Q&A if you still have time, what I hope. Ms. Chen, do you hear me? Okay. I hear you. Okay, great. Um, yes, so I would say um, thank you very much again. And thank you for recovering so fast from COVID that uh, having you already up and running and great work you've done there for the forum. And I definitely um, looking forward to the next time and being there myself again next year. So I leave the word to you uh, to do start with a, a closing ceremony and I will then perhaps just add two or three words and then you're a, uh, I know you have to go to dinner and I know a lot of the visitors has to fly home so uh, we then close it here for the Chinese side and we will continue in the zoom session for some more questions okay thank you uh... Okay, good morning. Uh, uh, Morning.呃,在晚上好。呃,咱们论坛终于在两天的这个紧张的,呃,活动中结束啊。说几句话,我觉得这次论坛办得非常不容易。在短短的一个月之内啊,呃,我们把它成功举办。呃,来线下参加
，这个外方的组织也非常成功啊，谢谢。再一个就感谢我们这个几个小伙伴们，但是这些小伙伴们已经都在养着，所以嗯，已经都高烧，所以在酒店里休息。我是阳过了，所以就剩我一个人坚持了。嗯、呃，感谢的话不多说。再一个就是希望呢，呃，我们这次论坛带给各位的收获满满。呃，再一次呢，希望呢，我们明年二零零三年，呃，会大家会自自由畅游的，在在这个线下国内外嘉宾再次相聚。谢谢大家 ，Thank you。Thank you, uh, Ms. Chen, and again, thank you very much. Thank you to the local organizers. I always forgot this, and um, thank you to our sponsor, uh, Rolls Royce, um, who was sponsoring the e-flight forums, uh, like the team of Rolls Royce. I can say was sponsoring it from the beginning because first the team was under the label of Siemens, and they were our sponsors. And when the team changed to Rolls Royce, they continued to be our sponsors. So thank you for this. And we'll show you the nice flying video again after the official closing ceremony. So thank you very much for everything. One last remark: all the recordings of the sessions will be online on YouTube, on our eFlight Forum website, and as well on uh, the Chinese the Chinese version on a Chinese streaming channel. So if you missed something, if you didn't hear something right. You always can go back there, and we will also record now the rest of the Q and A's. So uh, if you miss something, if you have to leave for a plane, don't worry. You can have a look up after, and hope to see you all again next year, and hope to see perhaps in reality in some location in China. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next year. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, now we can continue our Q and A session. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let's see who's still here. Um, okay, so I have uh, another question on uh, Eric, which is um, the group you're forming there for this electric seaplane. Is this mainly just, or is mainly Norwegian, or is this also a team with uh, people entering from all different sides of Europe, for example, like on the propulsion system, on the battery system? I don't think you're developing, like Mike said, Mike friend said that uh, Zero Avia tries to have a vertical integration, doing all the stuff themselves. Themselves, uh, how is this we planned with? Uh, uh, your pro project of Elfi. We we plan to buy uh, from uh, vendors, and there is a lot of uh, great companies that are doing excellent work in trying to get new battery battery management systems. There is a lot of new engine manufacturers, and we talk to all the big ones. And um, we are not doing that ourselves. We want to buy that from some of the specialists in that field, because we can't do this by ourselves. It's hard enough to build a plane. <laughs> so, um, and in the team, there is actually Germans, Slovaks, uh, there is Indian, there is people from actually around the globe that works for us from also um, China and Peru. So we have a very international team in Norway and um, we need a lot of international collaboration because it's hard to find people that really are passionate and also very skilled in this aviation field and uh, it's a great thrill to work with these people and um, yeah I, I love this this is fun <laughs> okay um, I have a uh one question in addition to Gunther, when you said, okay, this kind of sportive plane, like the um, opener we've seen before, um, just a question, are there more companies like this, which have approached Dolph for maybe having an eVTOL flying uh, in? 
I know probably you can mention the names, but are there more, more companies looking into eVTOL as a sports utility in Europe? Um, for me, this is uh, hard to tell you because uh, I'm not um, within the or, or, or um, in the organization anymore. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, outstanding and so I do not have any access or, uh, okay. to, the, to the actual data. Mm, okay, um, but basically it could be said that if the, uh, the aircraft proves uh, uh, is ready, then there, uh, there would be some kind of, uh, we would have to add, add on a pilot's license for this aircraft, I suppose, because it is a, like we have different forms of pilot license in dual for different categories. So there would be a new pilot's license, I suppose. And uh, there would be uh, then uh, operation requirements like for other aircraft. Okay, it's good yes, to hear. It's, it's always, it's always uh, three things. It's um, uh, the, the technical, then the, the organization or the, 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 the licensing and uh, the, the operation part. And uh, um, none of these is uh, completely um, written into stone uh, for the ultralights in Germany yet. Okay, good. So, so it's a discussion project process and they should uh, connect with them. Okay, I think um, I see that several people already left. My questions are also basically done. I thank you both and everybody is still in the call. Or Mike, if you still have a question. <laughs> uh, I don't have so much a question as a comment for Eric. Uh, so, you know, I find the idea of, uh, uh, you know, an electric uh, flying boat quite interesting. And uh, I have a strong suggestion for you is, is uh, I have a lot of experience in developing aircraft with pusher propellers like the uh, Piaggio Avanti that I was involved in the wind tunnel testing for. And uh, uh, you should think very strongly about looking at a configuration that uses uh, tractor propellers. I think it's, it's, uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, it's yeah. not updated the drawings that you see here. This is yeah. uh, early sketches and preliminary sketches. As I said, we will have an unveiling of the new design that we worked on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, there is a lot of things about pusher and pr puller. And my, the main focus, these drawings has this configuration is to get out of the spray, right? But Right. Uh, it's well, there's there's also a good very, idea. there's also some very strong uh, acoustic reasons to uh, look at that uh, puller propellers. Uh, uh, you know, if you've ever heard the uh, the Piaggio Avanti fly, it's it's the most wonderful and beautiful airplane, and it's also uh, terrifically loud. <laughs> we yeah, we. I, I will take note of your uh, good input, Mike, and it might be that we have another design coming up <laughs> ah. that look different. Okay, uh, okay, very good. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think we should have this kind of discussions on a more regular basis. I think it's very fruitful getting people from around the world together and discussing these subjects. So yeah, maybe uh, we... Uh, try to organize something like this. So if one of you, for example, cannot come to Arrow, I already suggested the folks, and now they are open to this, that we will have a Zoom add-on there as well. So if you can't make mm -hmm. it, but you're interested, you can dial in. And so we can have this kind of discussions, which I think is quite helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So Willie, I, I will be coming to Arrow this year. So uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Okay, good. We, oh, see you and thank yeah, you. We for have, well, Sarah, me. Sorry, we have one question. Uh, if you still have time, there is an electric startup wrote uh, as a question. Chinese, we have to get, um, uh, if you China, come, if you, if you, if you come, I think I just let him. Um, okay, he, he will be in the he will be in the go. He, he let him ask his question directly. Uh, because it's a Chinese electric startup. And uh, yeah, he is coming. Uh, okay, Kenyon. Hello. Hello. Yes, now we hear you. Perfect. 
Yep. Ask your question. Nice. Yep. Uh, so I have a question about the hydrogen battery. Because uh, I'm just curious about the zero area for the uh, a thousand kilowatt level. I would like to ask uh, how is the density of energy of the battery? I mean, the system. So I, I think the question is how does the, the energy density, yeah. the yeah. fuel yeah. cell yeah. system, compared to yeah. a battery? Yeah. And, you know, I think we've showed. Uh, some charts even in the presentation that, that showed that, uh, you know, the, the energy density uh, uh, and can be up to uh, 10 times higher than the lithium batteries that are available. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the issues is that uh, everyone loves to talk about uh, uh, batteries uh, that are at the 400 watt hour per kilogram level. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very excited about battery technology, but also very skeptical uh, because many of these very high power battery solutions uh, look very attractive in the laboratory. But when you get into the real world, when it's necessary to uh, cycle a battery many times and to recharge it quickly, uh, you know, you really cannot achieve these kinds of fantastic uh, energy densities. Whereas it's already been proven. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna quote you exact numbers for the energy density of the, uh, the zero obvious system, but it, it will easily be much, much better than a battery system ever has the potential to be. Okay, very, very nice answer and uh, appreciate it. And uh, I have the last question is about the future, I think. Uh, how do you think the density, I mean, the energy density for the regional airliners such like ATR or Dash 8, this level, because we know this is the future, but uh, I would like to ask if possible. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, uh, the, the biggest change that will be necessary uh, for the system energy density for regional transports will be changing from uh, gaseous hydrogen to uh, liquid cryogenic hydrogen. And, uh, uh, you know, once we're talking about anything uh, more than a regional transport, when you want to have uh, a range in the, the thousand kilometer or 2000 kilometer range, uh, uh, the, the system will be required to have uh, cryogenic hydrogen. And that will have the, the biggest impact on the the system energy density. Okay, uh, thank you for this. I think we can continue all these uh, discussions in the next session, which could be, for example, then at Arrow, Friedrichshafen, you can save the date. Um, I now officially uh, close this forum with a presentation of our sponsor and a presentation of, here it is, of our own magazine on electric flying, where you can see where you can get it. It's a magazine for free on the internet available around the world. And so first, uh, the Rolls Royce uh, video, uh, and then uh, our own video. I try to share my screen and I already say thank you to all and thanks for having time uh, joining us. How can you get eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or 
just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying EV tolls and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye. Mm -hmm.